can start the, the third talk of this uh, section. Oh, good. section. Uh, uh, the title is Evolutionary Loss and uh, Regain of Gene Network Function. Uh, the presenter is uh, Gabor Balazzi uh, from Switzerland. And uh, I will let Gabor begin. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. And you can see the slides? And we can see the slides. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak at this thought-provoking conference. It uh, was great. Um, and um, for the purposes here, I'm an experimentalist. So I will try to show you um, actual evolving uh, biological systems, at least one of them. So um, to start, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, my student Mirna and uh, collaborator Michael uh, in Switzerland. I'm actually at Stony Brook University uh, in uh, New York State, so um, not too far. Uh, but um, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, science needs model systems. So, um, there's a lot of beautiful theory, but it's always nice to have a model system to test it. And model systems tend to be uh, not too complicated. Here is on the right, you see uh, Galilei <coughs> dropping spheres um, uh, to prove basic principles of um, free fall. So, of course, in thermodynamics, we have ideal gas. It's a model system. It's very useful. This is where we start. Um, in biology, you have yeast. It's a simple organism. Um, and we need uh, things like that for evolution. And here I will be talking about actual biological uh, evolution in the sense that Darwin uh, was thinking about it. So uh, genomes changing, cells changing uh, uh, genomes and phenotypes. And I would like to say that there is this emerging area of biology that is engineering based, it's called synthetic biology, um, which people used to create all kinds of nice devices, genetic gizmos, but uh, very importantly, it can give these model systems, for example, for evolutionary theory. And just pointing out that uh, evolutionary theory has existed, even though it's not all, always obvious, um, and there are extreme principles there, uh, starting from Darwin, when we talk about survival of the fitness, uh, we are talking about maximizing uh, a function, um, or the fitness function. Um, and uh, that's a basis of a lot of um, uh, phenomena uh, in evolution. All right. And uh, before we launch this, I'd like to just say a few words what I mean by fitness. Um, so these are actual data. Uh, collected in my lab. What we see here is uh, absorbance, which is um, a, a, a proxy for cell number. So as you see, the cell number is increasing time. And if you plot this in a log linear scale, you see it's an exponential increase. And what I mean by fitness is the um, uh, exponential co ex exponent, the exponential coefficient g. Uh, so the steeper that slope, the higher the fitness, the faster the cells grow. Um, what is evolution? So imagine you have a cell population which is growing exponentially at the rate f. There is a mutation and it starts growing at the rate g, which is higher than f. Then if you plot the fraction of the two, um, the higher fitness one, the g one, will take over. So that's basically how evolution proceeds and that's how that um, fitness maximum is reached um, in evolution. So where does fitness come from? So we work with cell populations. Um, and what we do is a, an experimental technique called experimental evolution, where we perform evolution in the lab. And what really evolves is uh, cell populations. So here is just an illustration of a cell population. But I, what I'd like to stress is that this is a multi-scale problem. Um, and where does that fitness of a cell population, which you see on the right, it's in a test tube, where does that come from? Where it comes from individual cells dividing. Individual cells dividing will give the whole cell population its exponential increase. Now, where do these single cell divisions come from? 
they come from genes that are uh, at a much smaller length, length scale dictating some of these cellular processes. And even though in evolution people talk a lot about sequence and mutations and so on, uh, an important point I'd like to make is that it's not just sequence, it's actually amounts, how much protein a cell has. So for example, here there is this green protein, uh, those cells which have that protein may have a different division rate and overall give a different fitness to the whole, whole population. So we'll try to explore a little bit how the population fitness, the macroscopic fitness arises from these microscopic uh, cell division events, which depend, uh, depend on even more microscopic molecular processes. So you could do that in real um, um, genomes, of course, they have very complicated genetic interactions that we don't completely understand. And this is where synthetic biology is useful because what we do is we can put together uh, these gene networks, which basically uh, consist of genes controlling each other. And it's good to start simple. What we had uh, done here is um, uh, an activator protein controlling itself and the target gene. So this is a positive feedback uh, gene network, which we will have control over from the outside with a chemical, a chemical inducer. So I will be talking about reversing evolution. For that, let's meet the system, uh, then let's drive it forward, and then we we'll try to reverse it. So what is the system like? This is the cartoon of this synthetic gene network I showed you. We put it into the cells, and it consists of two genes. There is the regulator and the effector. So the regulator's role is to um, communicate our control to the target, to the effector gene. Uh, and um, yeah, our control is this small molecule, we call it the D-knob, it's doxycycline. When we add this to the median, then it talks to the intermediary gene, which starts controlling the downstream gene, but it also controls itself. So that's why it has positive feedback. As a result, the target gene will increase uh, its protein production. So this, this is how we command uh, to the target gene. To understand this system, um, it's based on chemical kinetics. I don't have time to go into it, but essentially it's a noisy dynamical system. So eliminating noise, we can just look at the dynamical system. And uh, there is this approach to it um, um, outlined uh, a while ago, which basically looks at the cell and looks at protein concentration as a result of gain and loss. So constantly the cell makes new protein and uh, that protein is lost to all kinds of processes, binding, uh, degradation, dilution. And I'd like to um, emphasize the last one, dilution is important uh, and it results from cells growth. So as the cell volume expands, it dilutes out the contents, therefore it's equivalent to a degradation. So, um, and the protein level is the result of this influx and outflux uh, through gain and loss. Um, all right, so for this particular system that we put together, we can uh, plot the gain of uh, this free RTTA, which is at the core. This is the intermediary gene, which makes the self um, feedback, a positive feedback. Um, and um, we can analyze its uh, rate of gain and loss as a function of um, the inducer bound for. So what we get, and I'm showing you here hand-drawn plots. Uh, we have actual real plots in the publication, but the essence here is the topological relationship between curves. And that's very well illustrated here. And I can animate much easier this way. So what we do now is start with low docs. The human command is low. And what you see is you have only one steady state. That's this black point where the two curves intersect, which are the gain and the loss. So when gain equals loss, you have equilibrium, and that's down here saying that RTTA, this core protein concentration is low. Now let's turn that D knob higher, and when we do, then the red curve moves to the right. It basically slides along that uh, pink line and starts intersecting the blue line. So the system undergoes a saddle node bifurcation, and ultimately what happens is you will get uh, two stable steady states separated by an unstable steady state. So that's basically how we command it through this bifurcation. And here are, um, you know, the uh, calculations on top showing how you scan this um, control molecule and a new steady state emerge, uh, two new steady states emerge. And down here are actually experimental results. 
showing that above a threshold, you get uh, two stable steady states. Good. So now um, we have these states and we can measure how cells distribute in them. And uh, as you see, uh, you see two peaks. So one natural question is, do the cells move between the peaks? And they indeed do. We can measure this. I don't go into this. But one something you may notice is that this switching is asymmetric. So cells move primarily upwards and they don't really go downwards. And I call these states low and high. Uh, you can imagine this is a, a society where you have low income and high income and basically people like to move to the high income place. Nonetheless, how can they be equal? So it's a puzzle. Uh, it's obviously a, a not uh, something fishy about this until you look at the growth rates. So it turns out that actually the high, the high income state is slower growing. So basically the low income state repopulates its, itself while always moving to the high income state. So the uh, growth and switching rates are both uh, asymmetric and they cancel each other out to give basically symmetric distributions. And um, this is where um, it's obvious it's non-equilibrium statistical physics. Unlike in, let's say, protein folding, where you go back and forth, here you have uh, growth added to this process. So if you look at cells as a, a switching system between high and low, uh, you see that the high and low ratio is not equal to the tra transition rates because the growth rates come in. And you can easily reconcile that problem by adding uh, growth to the switching matrix. And essentially the growth, the macroscopic growth, will be the maximum uh, eigenvalue of this uh, matrix. So that's how we go from microscopic events, uh, low and high cells growing differently, to macroscopic uh, population growth. All right, and here is just a, a, a note to Themis. This is actually a population uh, um, um, process where you can take temporal averages and um, population averages and, they, uh, and statistics, and they will not be the same. Uh, because of unequal growth. So there are these interesting uh, properties of this. So this is what the system is. Now, uh, what do we do with it? Um, we said that when um, they are in this high state, they are uh, growing slower. What does that mean? It means that that high state is costly to them. Uh, they have to pay a growth cost to be there. So the question is, what if we evolve this system? Uh, it's like having um, a costly state and letting it go. And obviously the expectation is that that state will go away because it has cost. If the cells can get rid of it, then they will fall down to a, a no cost, so a, a better state. And that's indeed what happens was this shows, it's complicated, but it shows all the mutations and picking one of them, which you can do, you see that indeed the expression of the system falls down. So the protein is no longer produced because um, this activator is broken. All right, so that was the forward process. Uh, we broke the system. Um, uh, now let's see if we can repair it. To do that, I'd like to add another knob. We had the D knob. Now we add the Z knob, which is a drug. And it's, it's important because the second protein, the effector protein, protects from that drug. So that gives you a benefit. Uh, because the drug would um, uh, suppress the cells. So this is a rescue. Um, and the question is now that we broke the system, what if we add this drug, can we pressure it to repair itself? And how does it do it biologically? So uh, we did this experiment, uh, long story sh short, in two weeks, we observed in seven different cases, we had different uh, families of behaviors. Uh, on the right, you see a simple behavior. The blue is a control and the magenta is um, uh, the uh, one in drug where you add the pressure to repair this circuit. And the hallmark of repair would be uh, the emergence of a second peak. But you see that the magenta moves a little bit, it shifts, but it doesn't develop a, a second peak in any of these four cases. Now you look on the left and you see a different story Right there, you start seeing, seeing these peaks emerging. So you see these um, high peaks for temporary, uh, at least temporarily, they come up and then they disappear. So what's going on? What, are, what is different between these um, evolution um, scenarios? 
So to understand that, we went back to the um, nonlinear dynamics model, and uh, we said, how did the circuit break? How did it lose expression? So we start with a functional circuit, right? It has two stable steady states. And then we realize that there are two ways for this to go away. Of course, you can just flatten that blue curve and it's lost forever, or you can shift that blue curve to the right and you will have one intersection that the other two intersections disappear. So this is a possibility. Uh, on the other hand, when you add the drug, then what happens? The drug slows down the growth. So even though the blue curve shifted with the drug, the red curve catches up, it slopes down and meets the, green, uh, the blue curve again on the left, not on the right. So this could be a possible explanation of those two scenarios. And let's see what happens next. You know, this is where the temp transient peaks appear. But then what happens? The cells accumulate new mutations, which speeds up growth again. So the red curve tilts back. And once again, you lose by stability. Um, so this is pr pr uh, an interesting uh, hypothesis, but can we test it? Yes, we tried it without the, the drug. We added ethanol. It has nothing to do with the gene circuit, but it slows down growth. And the prediction is if you slow down growth, you should get this high expression peak. And indeed you do, as you see, um, due to ethanol, uh, according to the prediction, you get the high expression peak. So essentially slow growth, which contributes to dilution to the loss of protein, uh, gives you this possibility. But then you may say, hey, wait a minute. You uh, made this right shift of the blue curve. What if you shift it down? Uh, that's another possibility for the curves to miss each other. And indeed, uh, you can get, get uh, loss of Y stability there. And when the cells grow slower, they recapture it. And then when uh, they start growing faster, actually there is a chance here for not losing the bi stability again. So this is what I call repair. And um, these are the two scenarios, shifting right, shifting down. Uh, the question is which one works? And long story short, we found a way to distinguish them. And that is by adding hyperinduction, which means moving the red curve up without changing growth. And this is what I'm illustrating here. So you start here, you move it up. And for the right shifted case, you can get- One more minute. Yes, and I'm finishing up. This is how we could classify these mutants uh, according to the falling down or shifting right. And we got um, repair of this gene circuit and we identified the mutations. But the essential point I wanted to make is that these synthetic gene circuits are model systems for evolution. Um, then slow growth can give you access to these dynamical states which are hidden. And importantly, nonlinear dynamics and evolutionary dynamics interact here. And we got regain of function interestingly without mutations in the circuit. So with that, I thank um, uh, everyone for the attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we have time for questions uh, for Gabor's talk and also for the talks, uh, the previous talks. There's no more talk in this uh, session. So uh, you can use some of this time for discussion for anyone who has the question. Please, if you have a question, unmute yourselves and uh, ask it.